Father, thank you again for being our God. Just the joy of our relationship with you, Lord, how you love us. You're always with us. You'll never leave us or forsake us. Thank you, Lord. We welcome you here tonight, Lord. We ask that you would teach us those lessons we need to learn as we go through 1 John, those important lessons, Lord, that show us that you're light and then how we're to live, how we're to walk in the light as you're in the light. And Lord, just keep teaching us and Lord, help us to grow in you. We love you so much and we just pray for our worship tonight. It would honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. This evening, if you would, please turn in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2 as we're continuing our study through the Word of God. And we're going to finish up chapter 2 this evening. We got into it uh, last week, the first 11 verses. And the section is dealing with God as light, and it covers chapters 1 and 2 of 1 John. And again, that is something that is so important for us to understand, especially when bad things happen in our lives, especially when we see what's going on in this nation and stuff. We can lose that perspective that God is light. And John wants us to know there's no darkness in him at all. That's what he says, John, 1 John 1, 5. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Not one blemish, not just a little darkness, absolute perfection. And we have to understand that truth, like I said, because, you know, when those difficult times come, when situations we're up against are overwhelming, we can lose sight of the fact that God is light and there's no darkness in him at all. And then what happens is we try to blame God. You know, we saw it in our study, our studies in Ruth, where, you know, Naomi was kind of blaming God for this. God, you did this to me, is what she was basically saying. But no, there's no darkness in God. And what he allows in our life, he always allows it for good. In fact, in James chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, James remind us, reminds us by saying, Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. That's so important, again, for us to understand. And in chapter 2 of 1 John, since we know that God is light, the focus is what, that we should walk accordingly or walk in the light as he is in the light. You see, if we're walking in darkness, then we're not walking with God, as I said. Why? Because there's no darkness in God at all. And we're going to look at several points here in 1 John chapter 2, uh, the spiritual state of believers or how they mature in the faith in verses 12 through 14. Then the focus of our love, uh, do we love the world or do we love the Lord in verses 15 through 17. And then he moves into the deceptions that are coming and have come into the church in verses 18 through 23. And again, man, in the days we're living in with social media, all the false doctrine you want is out there. It is amazing. You can find it. But we'll deal with that as we get to those verses. And then he moves to the truths of God that we have uh, that can set us free from those deceptions that are out there. Really, and that's the important thing in verses 24 through 27. And he closes out the chapter uh, looking at how we should be when our Lord appears since we're children of God, that we don't have to be ashamed in Christ. And that's verses 28 through 29. So a lot of ground to cover tonight. Let's pick up 1 John chapter 2, starting in verse 12. And let's see what the Lord has for us this evening as we study his word. John said this, I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his namesake. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you, little children, because you have known the Father. I have written to your fathers, because you have known him who was from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. Now, when John speaks of little children, he's using the Greek word technion, and it means little born ones. And the thing is, who is John speaking of here? And there's a lot of ideas out there. So out there, some feel it's a, a new Christian, a baby Christian, you might say. I don't think that's his point here in verse 12. In verse 13, I think he's specifically speaking of a young Christian or a baby Christian, a newborn Christian, and we'll deal with that in a few minutes. 
But John's going to use this phrase, little children, elsewhere in this letter. And I think he's speaking to all believers because we're all born into the family of of God. We're born again. In fact, the word technion refers to all the children of God. That means young, old, and in between. And because he says your sins are forgiven you. Isn't that how we become children of God? We come to saving faith by believing in Christ, and what happens? Our sins are forgiven. That's becoming a child of God. And he says, for his name's sake. What does that mean? It speaks of the fact that we're forgiven on the basis of who he is and what he's done. And I praise the Lord for that. David said in Psalm 23, 3, he restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Asaph said in Psalm 79, 9, Help us, O God of our salvation, for the glory of your name, and deliver us and provide atonement for your sins for your name's sake. I can't forgive my sins. My sins are not forgiven for my sake. They're not forgiven for anything that I deserve, anything that I've done. It's for his name's sake. And, you know, this whole idea... John dividing up little children or little born ones into two groups of people now. He talks about fathers and young men. And that first group, fathers, are part of the little born ones. Why? Because they're born again Christians. He's writing to, to believers there. And these believers, what do they do? They know the father. It's gnosko in the Greek, to know. And it's by experience. In other words, It's speaking of someone who's been walking with the Lord for a while. They are mature in the faith, and they have life experiences with the Lord. You know, too many times today we we think of experiences as being bad, but we experience the Lord every day. It's just sometimes people experience the Lord contrary to what the Bible says, and that's wrong. But we do experience the Lord. That's a wonderful thing. And... Think about it. They are holding on tight to God the Father because they know him and they understand that he's looking out for them. That happens as you mature in the Lord. And it's hard to cling to the Lord unless you spend time knowing him. How do we know God? Well, by being in the word, by being in fellowship with him, by applying the situations we uh, face in our daily lives um, according to the word of God. We get to know him that way, experience him. They tasted and they saw that the Lord was good. I like that. Now, let me give you a perspective. Because, you know, the storms of life will blow through. And it's not just one time. You know, remember when Jesus was tempted by Satan in the wilderness? I think it's in Luke. It says he left him to another, to a more appropriate time. Satan left him, but not completely. And that's so true in our own lives. Yeah, sometimes he's attacking us, and I, he attacks us through his demons that he uses. Uh, we can't be possessed by the devil, but we can be oppressed by the devil very much. How are we going to stand? Well, again, let me give you this perspective. Huge, tall tree, right? It looks really impressive, but a strong wind can come and blow it down to the ground. Why? How could that happen? It's so tall. It's impressive looking because its roots are not firmly established in the ground. And all you can see is what, above, what is above ground. And when the storm comes, it doesn't stand. I, I think it's the redwoods out, out in California, if I remember right, you know how they're massive trees. But the root system is not really deep. What's interesting is their roots entwine with the other roots of the other redwoods, and they hold each other together. Well, yeah, isn't that what we're supposed to do as well? We put our roots firmly in Christ so we could stand strong through the storms of life. And we encourage each other through the storms of life. That's one of the things that, you know, with the whole COVID and lockdown things, that whole fellowship was destroyed, wasn't it? We were on our own. We were isolated in our homes. Well, I was here, but nobody else, you know, I was just talking to chairs. Not a fun thing to do. 
But again, when we gather together, what, wasn't that the most awesome thing? Ah. Oh. The enemy loves to divide and conquer. Let's not let him do that. Let's stand strong in the Lord. Let's have our roots firmly established in Christ because we won't blow away. Great lesson. John then speaks of young men or those who have maybe not walked with the Lord a long time but are facing the battles that Satan is throwing at them and they're standing strong. Why? They're standing strong in the Lord. And then John speaks of little children again. But he uses a different Greek word here, which is really interesting. He uses the Greek word padia. And it's a word that donates a, a young, immature child uh, who are still under their parents' authority and instruction. Someone who's really young. Newborn Christian, you might say. They know the Father God, but they still have some growing up to do. And, you know, as cute as little children are, if they don't grow up, that's tragic. And that's true with Christians. You know, Paul in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 1 through 3, makes that point. He says, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal. As the babes in Christ, I fed you with milk and not with solid food. For until now you were not able to receive it. And even now you're still not able. For you are still carnal. For there are envy, strife, and divisions among you. Are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? I find it interesting that he uses envy, divisions, these things, uh, strife, to say they're immature. He didn't say that they didn't know the Bible. He didn't say that they weren't going to church. He said, look at how your life is. Look at what's being manifested with this envy, strife, and divisions. You're still a spiritual baby. You haven't matured in the Lord. You haven't grown. And then John again speaks of these young men being strong. And I, I, that just makes sense. You know, think about it. You don't send children into battle, do you? I mean, that would be ridiculous. And you don't send old men into battle. Why? Because we're old. <laughs> we don't want to sleep on the floor anymore. We don't want to sleep on cots anymore. We want the big, firm mattress or whatever, you know? But you send the young men. Why? Because they're strong, it says in verse 14. They're able to do battle with the enemy. And he uses the Greek word uh, for strong that speaks of a power that has been given to them. Where's that power coming from? It's coming from the Lord. The word of God that gives us the power to overcome who? The wicked one. The sword of the spirit. How do we stand strong against the battles against the devil? With the sword of the Spirit, you put on the whole armor of God. These young men are on the front line doing God's work among his people. And in a sense, we all are, but different roles at different periods in our lives. From here, after he's talking about these believers, now he's going to give this warning. Because make no mistake about it, because you are a Christian, the enemy is going to set up traps to trap you, to trip you up. Look at the warning. Do not love the world, in verse 15 here of 1 John 2. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. We need to understand what this is saying because, again, Satan will use these things to get us to love the world to move away our love from God. It's, the world sometimes competes with our love for God. And John says you can't love God in the world. Now, what does he mean by that when he says world? I mean, you mean I'm not supposed to look at nature and just be amazed and Praise God for the creation that he created. No, that's not what he's talking about. There's the beauty of nature out there. God's created all things. Yes, sin has corrupted it, but there's still that beauty. He's not referring to people because we're to love people of this world. In this context, the Greek word world, cosmos, is speaking of those things that are in opposition to God. 
all the evil that we see out there, this evil system is all under the authority of Satan. And maybe 50 years ago, we didn't see it as blatantly as we do today. Today, it's hard not to see it. And you can go all the way back to Genesis chapter 11 and the Tower of Babel, where man rebelled against God. And that rebellion of man against God permeates the world today. One writer put it like this. He wrote, Cosmos world does not refer to the physical earth or universe, but rather to the spiritual reality of the man-centered, Satan-directed system of this present age, which is hostile to God and God's people. It refers to the self-centered, godless value system and mores of fallen mankind. The goal of the world is self-glory, self-fulfillment, self-indulgence, self-satisfaction, and every other form of self-serving, all of which amounts to hostility toward God. Yes, remember, John has told us that God is light. There's no darkness in him at all. So if we're walking in opposition to God and what he wants, we're not walking in the light. We're walking in darkness. We're not walking with God. James hits that hard, James 4.4. He says, adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Wow. Now, does that mean we can't hang out with unbelievers? No. But they can't be our close friends. We can't have that koinonia relationship with them. Why? Because they're not believers. But we want to share Christ with them. We don't isolate ourselves on a little Christian island. We wouldn't even get along if we did. No, we're to be in this world, but the world's not to be in us. That's the key. And man, you know, there is such a tremendous pull the world has placed upon people today, and it's, being, it's easy to be drawn into their, those destructive ways. You know, the world wants our time, our attention, our resources, our money. And when we're drawn down that path, we lose sight of God. And John speaks of three things that Satan uses to draw us away from God. And it's interesting. Satan really hasn't changed his ways. It's not that he's not smart, but he just hasn't had to. We're not smart. We didn't learn the lesson from the Garden of Eden, and we'll talk about that. But if something works, why change? And that's the whole idea. The lust of the flesh. That's Greek word that John uses speaks of a craving or a passionate desire. There's nothing wrong with that. Could be good, but it also can be bad, depending on the context of the sentence. Here, obviously, it's not good. It's used negatively because the Greek word for flesh is sarx, and it speaks of carnality. It speaks of the depraved nature of man that is governing his life, his reason, his will, his emotions. So how do we know if something is right or wrong? How do we know if something is of the flesh or of the spirit? God's word opened up to us by his spirit. That's as simple as that. But here the person is given over to satisfying his fleshly desires. No concern for anything else, which is, again, Paul talked about that, that in the end times, the last days, men will be lovers of themselves. And we see that so much today. Remember a few years back with all the selfies, it was made me nauseous to see them all. Oh, my gosh. And people were falling off of, you know, buildings. They were falling off of mountains because they're trying to take a selfie, not paying attention to where they're at, and they end up dying. Crazy. Then John speaks of the lust of the eyes, and that's just, it means what it says. Job said, I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman? Job 31.3. You see, Job purposed in his heart that he would not look upon a woman lustfully. He took a stand with his eyes and refused to look or take that second look. And David said in Psalm 101.3, I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. You know, don't put things in front of your eyes that are going to cause you to lust after them. We have to be wise. This person is just given over to carnality. 
And when you think about it, you know, look at what's on, you know, the television advertisements or, you know, you go to the store and see all the things that are there. You know, for me, I, I had a I had a nail and a screw in my tire. Those are not good things. Tires don't like that. So I went to the store or the repair shop to get it fixed, and they wouldn't let me sit there and wait for it to get fixed because of COVID. So they said, you could go into the store next door and walk around, and we'll call you, or you can go wherever you want. Well, what were they saying? Go spend some money over in our store, and we'll call you when we're done. I didn't. Diane saw me. She thought I was lost just walking aimlessly through the store. I wasn't lost. I was just walking aimlessly through the store for over an hour. I mean, you know how many times I went back and forth through the aisles? I'm sure security was looking at me. Watch that guy. He keeps going back and forth, and he's looking at his watch, and yeah. But they try to get your attention to buy something. I mean, look at, you know, some television commercials, how they sell hamburgers. They get these beautiful women on there. Or beer commercials, beautiful women. Why? Well, if I buy this beer, these beautiful women will come around me. Are you kidding me? But we do. We buy the beer or the hamburgers or whatever because of the advertisement. The lust of the eyes. And then the pride of life. You know, boasting, bragging, impressing others by what you have done. But we can't do anything apart from Christ. And, you know, once we start boasting, boasting, boasting about what we have done, God is taken out of the picture. I got this, God. Don't worry about it. Oh, my gosh. I don't want to get in your car right now. Sorry. That's not a good thing. Our Lord is the giver and the sustainer of life, and we can only do things because of him. So there's no room for pride. And like I said, these tactics are not new. He used them in the very beginning in the Garden of Eden. That's why it's amazing we're still taken by them today. Genesis 3, verses 1 through 7. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Look at how Satan tempted Eve in the garden. It fits with what John is saying here in 1 John chapter 2. The lust of the flesh. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, desiring the flesh, feeding the flesh, lust of the eyes, it was pleasant to the eyes. That's an easy one. Pride of life, a a tree desirable to make one wise started in the garden and it continues on today and John's warning us once again he used this to tempt Jesus in the wilderness lust of the flesh if you're the son of God command that these stones become bread he was fasting for 40 days he was at the point of starvation and so now what does he tempt him with the lust of the flesh here's just out of these stones make some bread so you can eat you're starving There's the pride of life. If you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it's written, he shall give his angels charge concerning you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Hey, you're the son of God. Just do this, man. And the lust of the eyes. The devil took him on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Hey, look at All this could be yours. Take a good look with your eyes. I can give you all the kingdoms of the world. Wow. 
How did Jesus combat those temptations by Satan? He got his 40 Days of Purpose book out. Oh, he didn't do that? No. He said, it is written, exclamation mark. I don't have to deal with Satan and talk with him. You're wrong. This is what the Bible says. I'm done. It's not a big conversation. You, know, you, you look on Facebook today, and man, people just vomit all their information out for pages and pages. Like, oh my gosh, how much time do you have? No, it is written. That goes against what God's word has said. We're done. End of story. The word of God is the sword of the spirit. That's what we use in our battles. We have to pay attention. Why? Because there's a battle going on. Paul said the flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. They're contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. Isn't that interesting? The flesh and the spirit are contrary to one another. That seems obvious to us, right? Well, then why does the church want to make their church is seeker-friendly, to make them more worldly, I don't get it. There's that battle to make the church worldly or to make it more spiritual. How do you make it more spiritual? It is written. You just teach the word of God. You do the things that God has said in his word. Yeah, but a lot of people don't like that and they won't come in. You know what? You just taking the Holy Spirit completely out of the picture. Don't you think the Holy Spirit can woo people and bring them across our path or bring them into a church building? Absolutely you can. Don't compromise your faith. We need to be wise. As Paul said in Romans 12, too, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Being conformed is easy, right? Think about it. New fashion statement, it's all over you know, the internet, it's on TV, and what do you see? Everyone's wearing them. You know, when I was growing up, when I was in junior high, it was bell bottoms and you know the big shoes that was the style everyone was wearing them i i hey i don't want to be out of the picture so everyone dresses the same god says i want to transform your life if i look like the world then the unsaved are going to see me like them there's no difference. Why are they going to be drawn to me? I look just like them. But if I look different, and I'm not saying necessarily with the style of clothes I wear, but with my whole attitude. I look at the world today, and I, especially in our nation, isn't it really negative? Everything is horrible. You got fighting going on all over the place. You know, remember when that President Biden said, you know, when he gets in, we're not going to have all this, this turmoil in this country. Look at how many shootings are going on. I, you know. But for me, I have great hope. You know, not this Saturday, but next Saturday, I'm going to be teaching in Calvary uh, Sunrise in Oshkosh at a men's study. And uh, the Lord brought me to uh, a study where the Moses sent the children of Israel into um, the promised land to spy it out, 12 spies. And the message is discouragement or encouragement. Who are we? Are we discouragers or encouragers? We should be encouragers. And yeah, I know things look bad out there, but the Lord's in control. I don't have to worry about it. Yeah, but what if he closes this down? I think he has a plan. I, I don't worry about it. Yeah, I told you before, you know, when, before we put up the radio station and everything, people were saying, hey, why are you doing that? The government's going to shut it down. You're not going to be able to be on the air. You know, that was like, what, 15 years ago? We've been on the air for 15 years. So will they shut us down? Could be. 
I don't, I don't worry about it because God's in control. What about the Internet? What if they take us off the Internet? When the church got started, you, you know what was interesting to me? There was no Internet. There was no television. There was no radio. What did they do? They walked around bringing the gospel message. It's as simple as that. We could still do that today. Well, what if they, you know, get mad at us? What if they put us in jail? I don't know. Read the story of Paul. See how that happened. You know, he, he got put in jail and the whole palace guards getting saved. Christians are getting encouraged. I think God knows what he's doing. John Bunyan was put in prison. And he used to preach at the fence of the, the prison. People from all over would come and hear him preaching. And the guards, the government was so mad, they put him in the deepest depths of the prison so no one could hear him any longer. And you know what happened? He wrote Pilgrim's Progress. Wow. God's not silence. Remember John, the Apostle John? Domitian tried to boil him in oil, according to History, we don't know that for sure. Didn't work, so he sent him to the island of Patmos, a barren rock penal colony. And what happened there? Oh, God gave him the revelation of Jesus Christ. Don't limit what God can do. Not at all. I, I don't worry about these things. I want to be an encourager. I want to encourage people because they've lost all hope. You know, I, I was talking to my wife the other day, and I said, you know, it's kind of funny that uh, maybe I was talking to my mom, actually. Um, I said, isn't it funny that we can trust car salesmen more today than the news media? What happened? They're like people we trust more than a lot of other people. They used to be on the bottom of the list. They've kind of come up a lot. People have lost hope, and we can give them the hope that's in God. God wants to transform our lives. He wants to renew us. And we need to shine the glory of God. You know why? Think about this. As Christians, who indwells us? Jesus. Well, that's kind of interesting because Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Now, I used to, people used to say, well, we're like the moon. We reflect the light of Jesus. But that's not the word that Jesus used when he said, you're the light of the world. The Shekinah glory, the glory of God is in us, shining out of us. Wow. Think about that. We'll deal with that when we get to the Gospel of John in a few weeks here. It's an amazing study when you look at it. God's indwelling us, and his light should be shining from us. Don't cover it up. And I don't mean with clothes. I mean with all the other garbage in our life so people can't see the light. This world is definitely in opposition to God. But boy, I look at, I, I was reading the story of, of David and Goliath, and uh, here's this little kid with a slingshot and a stone. He takes out the giant. Why? Because he trusted God, and he walked by faith. That's what God calls us to do. I don't care how dark it gets. I don't care how big the enemy is. I don't care about any of that stuff because my God is bigger than all that. And I don't care how giant they are. I don't care about any of that. I'm actually giving you my study from the men's study in a few weeks. But I don't care about any of that because my God is working in, with me. Never forget that, guys. Well, we need to move on. Look at verse 18 of 1 John 2. Little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. If they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. Who is John writing to specifically here. Well, little children or little born ones or born again ones, like I said, to believers. And his point is, look, we're living in the last hour. And it speaks of the last days or the time period that started 
with the first coming of Jesus Christ and will continue on until the second coming. And as you read this, it seems that John was expecting the Lord's return at any moment. It didn't happen. Yeah. Is it going to happen in our lifetime? I don't know. I, I think it is. I live with that expectation every day. It could be today. And that's how we should live. The biggest sign for me is the establishment of Israel as a nation, the birth of the nation of Israel. It's the biggest sign for me that they returned in the, to the land of Israel in 1948 on the heels of almost being completely destroyed, wiped out by Hitler, over 6 million Jews killed, murdered. And back in 1967, they recaptured the city of Jerusalem. And John's going to tell us as he finishes up this chapter that those that have this hope in the soon return of Jesus will purify themselves or that they have an attitude that it's going to help them to live a godly life. Why? Because the Lord's coming back. I want to be doing, I want to be serving him. And yeah, the Antichrist is coming. But John says, look, his workers are already on the scene. The false teachers, I believe, is what he's talking about. Those that are moving people away from the truths of God that are found in the word of God with their false doctrine. And think about it. What's the best way to destroy the church? Some people will say, well, persecution. It's interesting, if you look historically, persecution has always strengthened the church and grown the church. The best way to destroy the church is to infiltrate the church and bring in false doctrine. And that's exactly what we see happening. We see the compromise and watering down of the word of God, moving away from the truths of God found in the word of God, and churches and lives have been destroyed because of it. Some say that Genesis is just a story and God used evolution to bring man and life into being. Now, is that a foundational truth? Well, no, but man, if you believe in evolution, then why do you need Jesus? What is the point of him coming? If there's no original sin. And you know what? Jesus believed in Adam and Eve. He should because he's God. He, He created them, right? So when someone says, you know, this whole creation thing, we we have evidence with evolution that's true. Am I going to listen to what a man's telling me or what God is telling me? When evolution was brought in, they had all the evidence. They had all the answers. And Christians failed to trust what God's word has said. You've probably seen some of the articles in, you know, the little magazines. You know, there was no David. There was no Solomon. Front page headlines, you know, right on the cover. And then several months later, they discover something that shows that, yeah, there was King Solomon and he was a real person. And you'll never find it on the front page, but you'll find it tucked away with a few verses or a few uh, passages at the back of the magazine. Don't trust, man, I don't care what kind of evidence they have. Oh, we found, we found a transitional form. Don't lose your cool. Just wait for the rest of the evidence to come out. There are no transitional forms from a cat to a dog or whatever. Not going to happen. But it's worse than that. Churches denying the deity of Jesus, his virgin birth, his atoning work on the cross of Calvary, denying the word of God or uh, just putting the word of God down so people don't trust in it anymore. It contains truth. What you know, we don't really know what is really true. We'll pick it, we'll tell you what's truth. They deny his return, sin, and the list goes on and on. And John says, Look, these false teachers, 
that had infiltrated our churches that were spreading their false doctrine, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. Now, again, John's not saying, hey, if you leave one church and go to another, you're not saved. No, that's not what he's saying. He's talking about false teachers here. And they left the church. Why? Here's the reason. The church wouldn't stand for their false teaching. And they either left on their own accord or they were kicked out, removed from the church. We have seen this over the years, and um, winds of doctrine are going to blow through the church, guys. And that's why God has brought in pastors, teachers. So you, we will not be blown away by the winds of doctrine that are blowing through the church, tossed all over the place. Too many people set their sails up, and they're carried away. Not a good thing. In fact, Paul in Romans, chapter 16, verses 17 and 18, tells us what we're to do if there are people within the church that are spreading false teaching. He said, now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. Look, if they're going to continue bringing in their false teaching, you remove them from the church. It's the end of the story. Because if you don't, they will continue to gain followers and it will destroy the church because there will be division. The church has to stand up for the truths of God found in the word of God and not allow the spirit of the Antichrist to promote their false teaching. There's no reason we should be taken unaware of these things. We don't allow this to come in. Warren Worsby said this. He said, it makes no difference what you believe just as long as you are sincere. That's what a lot of people believe, right? He said, the statement expresses the personal philosophy of many people today. But it is doubtful whether most of those who make it have really thought it through. In sincerity, the magic ingredient that makes something, is sincerity the magic ingredient that makes something true? If so, then you ought to be able to apply it to any area of life and not only to religion, right? So just being sincere, he's saying, you should be able to apply to every situation you face in life. And he gives us some examples. A nurse in a city hospital gives some medicine to a patient. The patient becomes violently ill. The nurse is sincere, but the medicine is wrong, and the patient almost dies. Hmm. A man hears noises in the house one night and decides a burglar is at work. He gets his gun and shoots the burglar, who turns out to be his daughter. Unable to sleep, she has gotten up for a bite to eat. She ends up the victim of her father's sincerity. It takes more than sincerity to make something true. Faith in a lie will always cause serious consequences. Faith in the truth is never misplaced. It does make a difference what a man believes. If a man wants to drive from Chicago to New York, no amount of sincerity will get him there if the highway is taking him to Los Angeles. A person who is real builds his life on truth, not superstition or lies. It is impossible to lead, live a real life by believing lies. Absolutely. Absolutely. And yet many people fall prey, and they listen to the words of men more than the word of God. You know, I've heard it so many times over the years. Oh, you got to listen to this guy. You got to read this article. You got to do this. He's got the truth. No one else has it. This guy is right. That's a red flag. That's, you know, lost in space. Danger, Will Robinson. Danger, right? Um, it should be a red flag to all of us. I, when I check into these people, it's, they're false teachers with their false doctrine. And it should never be tolerated in a church. Not at all. How do we know? How do we know what's right and wrong? 1 John 2, look at verse 20. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, 
and that no one no that no lie is of the truth. He who is a liar, but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ, he is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. When people hear of the anointing, many times they flash back to the televangelists, um, those guys on TV. I have the anointing of God upon my life. There is nowhere in the Greek that it says televangelists have the anointing. It doesn't say that, does it? What does it say? You have the anointing. Isn't that interesting? He doesn't say, well, this, this group of people have the anointing. No, he says, you have the anointing. What is that speaking of? Well, it's speaking of the Holy Spirit who shows us the deceptions, expose them, exposes them to us as false. Why? So we don't fall prey to them. The Holy Spirit will expose these heresies with the truth of God's word. I remember several years ago, someone was reading a, a Christian book, and she just started reading it. And she said, I had to put it down because I just didn't feel it was right. Exactly. And I knew what book she was reading, and I knew it was wrong. And the Holy Spirit spoke to her heart and said, stop, don't read this. That's the anointing that John is talking about. And, and John says, you know all things. Well, how do we know all things? Think about it. How do we know all the things that are out there? By the word of God opened up to us by the spirit of God. It's as simple as that. As that. It exposes the false teachers and their false doctrines. One writer said this, he said, the presence of the Holy Spirit in every believer enables him or her to perceive the truth of the gospel and to distinguish it from error. Of course, some Christians have more perception than others due to God-given ability, satanic blindness, the influence of human teachers, sin in the life, etc. Another said, when a person is saved, he receives the indwelling Holy Spirit, and he enables the believer to discern between truth and error. When John tells his young readers, you know all things, he does not mean this in an absolute sense. It is not that they have perfect knowledge, but rather that they have the capacity to recognize what is true and what is not. Thus, the youngest, simplest believer has the capacity of discernment in divine things that an unsaved philosopher would not have. Absolutely. And when John speaks of knowing these things. He doesn't use the Greek word gnosko by experience. Edo is the Greek word. It means knowledge by intuition. Some things we know by intuition. The Holy Spirit, again, speaks to our heart about them. In fact, Paul in 1 Corinthians 2, verses 10 through 16 said this, But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit teaches us all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the spirit of God. They are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he, he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. If we have this anointing, if we have the Holy Spirit showing us, along with the word of God, what is right and what is wrong, why are so many people being led astray. Either they're not saved or they just are listening to the words of man rather than the words of God. It's as simple as that. It's not very complicated, guys. But I think pride sometimes gets in the way. I know I'm right. I can't be wrong. And God is trying to show you that's not correct. 
We need to listen. You see, we know who God is. We know who Jesus is because the word of God has shown us as the spirit of God has opened up the word to our hearts and our lives. And it's a tough battle out there, but man, if you reject Jesus, you're not saved. If Verse 23, if anyone denies the person and work of Jesus Christ, or as John wrote it, denies the Son, does not know God. They're not a true Christian. Wow, that's tough. Warren Worsby said, it's important that you stay with the truth of God's word. Absolutely. When I look at false teaching, I always find out that there has been a teacher that has brought this into that person's life through a book, through, you know, social media. Someone has brought this into their life. They didn't come up with it on their own. And when you try to share with them, hey, you know, this isn't right. This guy is way off. They get mad at you. Yeah. But you got to stay with the truth of God's word. What else do you have? I'm not infallible, even though I do tell my wife that. She doesn't believe it, so don't worry. There's only one who's infallible. That's God. So we compare everything that people say, even what I say, with the word of God, period. Again, Warren Worsby said, the word or message Christians have heard from the beginning is all you need to keep, your true, keep you true to the faith. The Christian life continues just as it began through faith in the Bible's message. A religious leader who comes along with something new, something that contradicts what Christians have heard from the beginning, is not to be trusted. Let the word abide in you and abide in Christ. Otherwise, you're going to be led astray by the spirit of Antichrist. No matter what false teachers may promise, you have the sure promise of eternal life. You need nothing more. If a false teacher were content to enjoy themselves in their own meetings, it would be bad enough. The tragedy is that they try earnestly to convert others to their anti-Christian doctrines. Exactly. That is why I have people removed or they don't stay because I don't want that garbage in here. Because it, again, is confusing and it causes division. As simple as that. Verse 24 in First John 2. Therefore, let that abide in you which you have heard from the beginning. If what you have heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. That's what Warren Worsby was just talking about. You see, how do we persevere during these threatening times when the spirit of Antichrist is growing? By abiding in Christ. By abiding in the truths of God found in the word of God. Don't let go of it. This should be our most treasured possession, the word of God. And, you know, we hear things, oh, that this is a new teaching. and Man, this, this, is, this is it. You know, I told you back in, I think it was 1970. It was 1970. 70 reasons why the Lord's coming back in 1970. It was a little booklet for a dollar. That's what he was selling it for. Sold millions of copies. I had people in the church when I was back in Chicago calling me. Pastor Joe, you got to read this. This is unbelievable. He's predicted the day that the Lord is going to return. Like, I, I don't really have time for that because he's wrong. No, no, but he's figured it out. He's wrong. The Bible says he's wrong, so I'm not going to waste my time, but thank you very much. Well, that day went, and you know what? He wrote another book. 71 reasons why the Lord, or no, maybe it was 90. I don't know. It was one of those. One of those. I think it was 90. Anyway, I'm getting old. But he wrote, he added another year. 71, 91 reasons why the Lord is coming back. And after that, he just stopped. Because, you know, you sell a book, a million copies of the first book, Maybe even a half million of the second. You're doing really good. You don't need to work anymore. But people still bought the second book. I'm like, come on. Pastor Chuck used to say, and I love saying it, if it's true, it's not new. And if it's new, it's not true. Simple as that. 
In fact, Paul in Galatians, chapter 1, verses 6 through 10, he said, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, then let them be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let them be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Exactly. And I think God is so amazing. You know, think about it. The angel Moroni gave to Joseph Smith all these different things. The Book of Mormon, right? We've got all these things, Mormonism. And Paul says, even if an angel from heaven gives you a different gospel. So I don't think I'm wrong here, but I think I can say the angel Moroni is full of baloney. I think that's pretty simple. Don't succumb to these philosophies of man. You're a bondservant of Jesus Christ. Don't be led astray. There was a missionary to the American Indians a while ago that was in Los Angeles and with an Indian friend who was a new Christian. And they walked down the street and they passed a man on a corner who was preaching with the Bible in his hand. And the missionary knew that this man represented a cult. But the, man, the Indians saw only a Bible and he stopped to listen to the sermon. Well, he said, I hope my friend doesn't get confused the missionary was thinking to himself, and he was praying. In a few minutes, the Indian turned away from the meeting and joined his missionary friend. What did you think of the preacher, the missionary asked. All the time he was talking, exclaimed the Indian, something in my heart kept saying, liar, liar. Exactly, that was the Holy Spirit. And we need to listen to what the Holy Spirit is telling us. That's the anointing of God that I was talking about. Well, verse 25. And this is the promise that he has promised to us, eternal life. Praise God, right? Eternal life. When God's truth lives in us, that which we've heard from the beginning, God lives in us, and we have that promise of eternal life. And yet, a large portion of Christians in America don't believe in absolute truth any longer. They don't believe the Bible is absolute truth. We're told this, past generations have looked to a source outside themselves, namely God in the Bible, for determining morality and truth. But a new study from the Cultural Research Center at Arizona Christian University shows that some 58% of Americans surveyed no longer believe uh, that and instead say it's up to the individual to decide what is true or moral. Wow. The American Worldview Inventory 2020 concluded that belief in absolute moral truth rooted in God's word is rapidly eroding among all adult American adults, whether churched or unchurched, within every political segment and within every age group. Shockingly, that does include American Christians, those who have historically pointed to the Bible as the source of absolute truth and the guide to how we should live our lives. The study found that evangelicals defined as those believing the Bible to be true, reliable word of God, amazingly, are almost as likely to reject absolute moral truth, 46%, as to accept it, 48%. And only 43% of those surveyed who identified as born-again Christians still embrace absolute truth. Wow. You wonder why the church is not having an impact in America anymore? Because we don't believe in the God of the Bible. We don't believe that the Bible is God's word to us. Wow. Now look at verse 26. These things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and it is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. So as in John's day, there will always be those who will try and deceive you. But again, we have the Holy Spirit. We have this anointing of God that's going to teach us the things we need to grow by. Now, here's where some people run on a tangent and take this to unbiblical conclusions. 
And I say context, context, context. John says you do not need that anyone teach you. So we don't need pastors. We don't need teachers. We just teach ourselves. Is that what John is saying? That's not what he's saying. Why in the world would John have written this letter if Christians didn't need anyone to teach them? He's writing this letter to the church, right? So obviously he's teaching them. So that wouldn't make sense. What's the context of this section of 1 John? Exposing false teachers who want, to embrace, who want you to embrace their false teaching. And we can do that because we have the anointing of God. The word of God opened up by the spirit of God. So what John is emphasizing here is that we have within us as Christians the only teacher that really matters, the Holy Spirit. But again, you read the letters in the, in the New Testament we need pastors. Paul in Ephesians talked about that. He gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Why? For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, the edifying of the body of Christ, till we come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. That is what the pastor's responsibility is to be. Teaching the word of God, building the people up in the faith, helping them to see their gifts so they can use those gifts within the body of Christ. But again, you can't leave it all in the hands of the teachers or the pastors. You have to do the studying on your own as well. You have to search the scriptures to see if what is being said is true or not. And if you want to know and understand the Bible, you don't have to look any further than the Spirit of God, the author who wrote it, will show you what it's all about. Well, let's finish up. Look at verse 28. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. So we have no need to be ashamed when Jesus comes. Why? Because we're abiding in him. We're his children. We're not going to stand before him in our own righteousness, which are like filthy rags, but the righteousness of Christ that has been imputed into our lives by faith. And I like this because knowing that the Lord is coming back helps us to live lives that would honor him. You know, I shared this before when I was growing up and, you know, I was the oldest, so I'd watch my other two brothers. My youngest brother wasn't born yet. Um, and I kind of knew when my parents were coming back. You know, they kind of gave you a time frame. And, you know, you get that two-minute warning. I always think of Dr. Seuss and the cat in the hat, you know. House is just in shambles. Oh no, we got to fix it up. And that's because I knew my parents were coming home. Hey, the Lord's coming back. And I don't want to be doing something that would dishonor him when he returns. I want to be doing things that would honor him. Wow. My mom has a picture of my dad when he graduated high school. And you know, it's one of those old, older pictures because, you know, he was around a long time ago. But if you look at that picture and you looked at me when I was in high school, you go, that's you. No, not at all. There's a family resemblance. I think that's what John is talking about here. As children of God, we should have a resemblance to our Heavenly Father, because we're born of Him. And that means our actions, our nature should resemble His. We're not going to be perfect. And, you know, it could get real discouraging sometimes. But we live and walk in the light as He is in the light. We shine forth Jesus as we abide in Him. And that's John's perspective. Don't love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father isn't in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but of the world. And here's the thing we have to remember. The world is passing away and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Hey, the Lord is coming back. We should be the most excited people on this planet. And we should be ready and looking for his glorious appearing and live accordingly. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much 
we've covered so much territory here in these verses here in 1 John chapter 2. But Lord, help us to remember them. Help us to apply them to our lives. Our desire is to grow in you. And Lord, we want to follow you all the days of our life. We want to walk in the light as you're in the light. And we want to shine Jesus to the people of this world. We're living in dark times and that light is shining even brighter because of the dark days we're living in. And may we never try to cover it or dim it, but just continue to shine. We thank you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.